Hi, I'm Sky Martin Thaler. Today, we stop by one of the brightest objects in our nighttime sky, our sister planet, Venus. But before we embark on that adventure, take a moment to click that red subscribe button below and the bell icon next to it for all the latest Rooftops of America and Rooftops of the Solar System updates. Our grand tour brings us to our second planet, the cloudy and deadly world of Venus. Venus favors the bold. It is our closest planetary neighbor, and often referred to as our sister planet. If you were to gaze into our solar system from afar, it would be easy to surmise that both Earth and Venus were formed from the same mold. They have a similar size, mass, and composition. The only immediate outside difference is that you'd notice that Venus is moonless. Venus shines brightly in our nighttime sky. Depending on the season, it's pretty easy to pick out in the morning or the evening, sitting there on the horizon. It's the third brightest object in our skies after the sun and the moon. It's so bright that it can actually cast shadows here on Earth. And if you know where to look, it's one of the only planets that you can spot during the daytime. This brilliant sphere is one of the first objects to appear as the sun begins to set, or the last to disappear as the sun starts to rise. Not surprisingly, humans have been gazing at it for a very long time, and it's easy to see why the planet has made its way into our legends and mythology, whether under the guise of the morning or evening star. Ancient people worldwide felt that Venus was an influential celestial body. No matter where you go or what culture, whether it's the Mayans, the Aborigines of Australia, the ancient Chinese, Venus made its way into legend and story. The first written record dates back to ancient Babylonia in 1600 BC. The astronomers of that time kept detailed observations of the planet with one archaeological discovery revealing 21 years of Venus appearances. They named the planet Ishtar, after one of the most important mother goddesses of Mesopotamia. Attributing female characteristics to it would be a trend that continues to this day. Almost all geographical features on the planet are named after female deities or famous historical women. Like Mercury, Venus was thought to be two objects as well. The Greeks called it Phosphorus in the evening and Hesperus in the morning. It wasn't until the great mathematician Pythagoras who finally figured it out that it was only one object. At that point, the Greeks took to calling it Aphrodite after the goddess of love and beauty. The Romans, well, they romanized that and called it Venus. At a glance, you could be forgiven for thinking Venus is almost identical to Earth. But a closer study would reveal that something was a bit off. With the advent of better optical instruments, the differences would start to make themselves apparent as our twin planet began to reflect more of its sinister side. Venus rotates in the opposite direction, the sun rising in the west, 
and setting in the east. It spins on its axis, incredibly slow, making it a world where a day is longer than a year. In 1610, Galileo would publish his findings, the first telescopic observation of Venus. And even with his rudimentary equipment, Galileo made a startling discovery, that Venus, like our moon, had phases. This was some of the strongest evidence yet for the Copernican view of our solar system, that the planets traveled around the sun and not the Earth. Over the centuries, further discoveries revealed that Venus had substantial cloud cover, but we couldn't peek through it to see the surface below. With its similarities to Earth, well, imaginations ran wild. Here was a lush, verdant world, clearly a place where life could call home, possibly even advanced civilizations. Reaching Venus would have been pretty straightforward. Once you got there, you'd descend through the cloud layers and before you would be a wet, humid, and swampy world. A worldwide ocean with floating islands on it. Bring the boat and a machete so you'd need it to hack through all the dense undergrowth. At least, that was one of the going theories about a hundred years ago. Most people probably would have thought it looked something like this. This tidal salt marsh behind me is at Bombay Hook National Wildlife Refuge. And it's an incredibly beautiful place filled with a diverse array of plants and animals. It's one of the largest and last found here on the eastern coast of the United States. And it's a pretty good representation of how someone in the 19th century would have described the surface of Venus to you. That dense cloud cover served as a blank slate and human imagination did the rest. With the rise of science fiction in the late 1800s, Venus soon took on a variety of roles, sometimes described as a water world covered in oceans, or other times as a hot, humid swamp. Surprisingly, there was also a third type envisioned, a dry desert world, but that was in the minority. One common element that was agreed on by all parties was Venus would be hotter. After all, that just seemed logical. It was closer to the sun than Earth. By the 1950s, there were scientists out there that were starting to put the pieces together. That maybe the reality of Venus was not how it had been portrayed. When the truth finally did come out, it would put the science fiction in those dime store paperbacks to shame. The first successful flyby of the planet was the Mariner 2 mission in 1962. It revealed a world that was hotter than expected, significantly hotter. Over the next decade, additional missions would be launched by both Cold War superpowers. But it was the Soviet Union that conducted some of the most dramatic missions on the planet. The Soviet Venera program was one of the great space exploration programs. It started in 1961 and ran for the next two decades until it finished in 1984. And in that time, it accomplished numerous firsts. Some of those highlights were the first successful soft landing on another planet, the first successful recordings of sound and images on another world, and for Venus, the first successful high-resolution radar mapping. With Venera, humanity finally got a real look at the hostile and desolate surface of Venus. 
In 1975, the Soviet Venera 9 mission landed on the surface of the planet, and despite its short lifespan, it was able to capture and transmit images back to Earth. What it saw was unlike anything else in our solar system. The cameras captured a world choked in heat and clouds, parched, rocky, and eminently deadly. While Venera had accomplished a lot of scientific feats, those findings and information would be held with a tight fist until the fall of the Iron Curtain. American missions in the 1970s gave us a glimpse of what Venus had to offer, but it wasn't until the 1990s that we were finally able to get a much more comprehensive view of the planet. In 1989, the space shuttle Atlantis launched the Magellan space probe. Magellan was designed specifically to peer through the thick cloud cover and map the surface of the planet. Once in orbit, the probe spent the next four years doing exactly that. And by the time it completed its mission in 1994, it had mapped almost the entire surface. Over the decades, we have continued to study Venus. The European Space Agency sent the Venus Express, which arrived in 2006. It spent nine years in orbit, conducting research of the planet's atmosphere. And the Japanese Space Agency currently has the Akatsuki probe in orbit, as it continues to uncover the secrets of our sister planet. Today, we've got a decent understanding of our sister planet, though there's still quite a few secrets we have yet to uncover. One thing is absolutely certain though, Venus is hell. Or at least it'd make a pretty good stand-in for it. In the 14th century, there was a famous Florentine writer named Dante Alighieri. Now Dante wrote one of the great classics of Western literature, the Divine Comedy. In it, he journeys through hell, purgatory, and heaven. The most popular part of this book is Inferno, where Dante and his guide, the Roman poet Virgil, journey through the nine layers of hell. And Dante is a pretty descriptive writer when it comes to hell. All of the sand fell slowly wafting down, dilated flakes of fire as a flakes of snow. But I think even the great Florentine poet himself would have a hard time coming up with something as brutal and torturous to human life as Venus is. It is the most hostile terrestrial body in our entire solar system. How it got that way is still a bit of a riddle, but we do have a few theories. Venus has its own share of weirdness. For starters, it is very round. And if that sounds ridiculous, consider that most planets are classified as oblate spheroids. Their axial rotation causes them to flatten at the poles and bulge at the equator. Venus, though, has neither of these characteristics. Its very slow rotation also means it lacks a magnetic field, and its intense heat has led to a different type of tectonic activity. It is theorized that at one point the planet did have oceans of surface water. In a bit of irony, this water, once a potential haven for life, became one of the primary drivers for its runaway greenhouse effect. At some point in Venus's past, an event caused the planet to heat up. Perhaps volcanism or an impact, but this is still being debated. But what is agreed is something triggered it. All it took was enough heat to be generated and enough carbon dioxide to enter the atmosphere that water started to evaporate. 
Now carbon dioxide's a pretty good trapper of heat, but it's got nothing on water vapor. Once the ocean started to evaporate, the greenhouse effect kicked into overdrive, and it just kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter until it was so hot that the carbon in the rocks was being sublimated. It was literally transforming into gas and coming out into the atmosphere where it mixed with more oxygen, creating more carbon dioxide. Once things had gotten so hot, hot enough to melt lead, the water vapor itself was being broken down into its individual components. With no magnetic field, most of the hydrogen has been swept away by the solar wind, and the CO2 remained and continued to keep things very toasty. The exact sequence of events is still being debated. But there is one absolute certainty. That Venus, at this time in its history, is the most deadly world to life as we understand it. And any sustained future surface exploration will be one of the greatest feats of science and engineering. The easiest part of this trip will be getting to the planet itself. Only a bit over three months of travel after launching from Earth. It is a veritable walk in the park in terms of interplanetary travel. After that though, the difficulty level spikes and things go from good to bad. The first challenge will be getting through one of Venus's most notable features, the thick and dynamic atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere is quite remarkable, with multiple layers, each with their own characteristics. And as we start our descent, we'll have a front row seat to it. It won't be long before we'll be bombarded by hurricane force winds that are whipping around the planet every four days in excess of 200 miles an hour. This is called super rotation, where the winds actually go faster than the planet's rotation. And Venus is one of only two places in our solar system where this is known to occur. Buffeted and battered, we will eventually reach an oasis of sorts, almost like the eye of a hurricane. Between 30 to 40 miles above the surface, at the boundary between the troposphere and mesosphere, the temperature and pressure are comparable to Earth. At this level, it is as close to an earthly paradise as you will find on the planet. In fact, as hard as this may be to believe, this is one of the most Earth-like areas in our entire solar system. Perhaps one way to explore Venus will be to actually use a concept that NASA has proposed. A crew of astronauts would float around the clouds in a dirigible. It would be an easy way to get from point to point. But the only real challenge is getting to the surface and back. As we continue our descent through the lower layers of the atmosphere, You'll notice that the wind is starting to slow and the air is starting to thicken even more. As we finally pass the sulfuric cloud layer, the world of Venus will start to reveal itself. And you'll see land features here that are completely foreign to what we have on Earth. You'll find you really are in an inferno because Venus is a world shaped by fire and lava, with over 16,000 volcano or volcanic features documented. While most are believed to be extinct, there is evidence that some are still active, erupting as little as a few hundred years ago. Finally, you'll touch down on the surface of Venus.
As you peer out the capsule window, the view before you will appear as a barren, rocky, bone-dry desert world, bathed in an orange-yellow hue. As you look upwards into the poisonous atmosphere, a soup of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and sulfuric acid, you'll see acid clouds and lightning. You'll see sulfuric acid rain fall, but evaporate before it reaches the planet's surface. Without a doubt, this will be the most challenging climb you will face. Just surviving will be a constant struggle. Venus ups the ante and throws everything, including the kitchen sink, at you. Along with the poisonous atmosphere, you'll have to deal with the intense heat. Venus is the hottest planet in our entire solar system. It has a constant surface temperature over 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Whether night or day, winter or summer, on the poles or the equator, it is always, always hellishly hot. But that's not all. There is also the unrelenting and crushing pressure of the air itself, on average about 92 times greater than on the surface of Earth, similar to what you would experience at depths of 3,000 feet in the ocean. This is the greenhouse effect at its most extreme. When it comes to pushing your equipment to the absolute threshold, then the climb to the rooftop of Venus is going to be the place where it happens. This is, without a doubt, the most technical and difficult climbing challenge in our entire solar system. To have it even enter the remote realm of possibility means having technology that hasn't even been invented yet. You need to be able to push back on the triple environmental threat of the crushing pressure, the blazing heat, and the corrosive nature of the atmosphere itself. To best understand how brutal this environment can be to Earth-manufactured equipment, we can look back at the Soviet Union's Venera missions. The longest a lander survived was just over two hours on the inhospitable surface. Only recently have we been able to develop a computer that is believed to be able to weather conditions on the surface of future Venus missions. If you want to make a comparison to something that's familiar in your own home, well think of this, your oven. Every modern oven comes with a function called broil. It's for direct, high heat, quick cooking. It gets very hot, very fast. And if you're not paying attention, it will burn your food to a crisp. But even the broil function will only get you to around 500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's still over 300 degrees less than what you would experience walking around the surface of Venus. Imagining what a protective suit would look like for Venus exploration would have to consider all three aspects of corrosion, pressure, and heat. It would probably be some combination of deep-sea underwater diving suit and power armor like you would find in science fiction. Then, it would have to be made from exotic metals like nickel or titanium to withstand all the elements. But for our high-pointing adventure, we'll get these future amazing scientific and engineering breakthroughs. As you step out of the capsule for the very first time on the Venus surface and slowly get your bearings in the world before you, you'll notice how things are quite different. You'll be in an incredibly dry, massive pressure cooker. The rocks 
will all be dull shades of gray and of a similar type of volcanic basalt. The nature of the wind has changed as well. It is still present, but it is now slower and, well, thicker. We actually know what it sounds like on the surface of Venus, complements of the Venera program. Needless to say, it won't provide any reassurance. The density of the atmosphere makes walking feel like you are constantly pushing into a wall. Making any progress on Venus will be more like swimming as the intense pressure has transformed the carbon dioxide at the surface into a supercritical fluid, a state with characteristics of both a liquid and a gas. To reach the rooftop of Venus, you'll need to wade through this sea of CO2. Another hindrance? You won't get too much natural sunlight. The clouds are too thick for the light to reach the ground. Imagine looking at the sun through a thick cloud of smoke or smog to get a feeling for what the sun looks like from the planet's surface. Visibility won't be great either, but it won't be because of dust. Venus has little of it. While the wind is strong enough to push pebbles and dust across the surface, it is more like sand in an ocean wave. Venus really doesn't have erosion like you may expect. But it's not all bad. There are a few silver linings. For starters, you don't have to worry about radiation. Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. But its ionosphere and that smothering blanket of clouds effectively block out the sun's solar wind. And on top of that, you get a gravity bonus as well. Gravity on Venus is 91% of that on Earth. But you might not realize that with all the protective equipment you have on. And finally, you don't have to worry about alpine starts. On this planet, the days last longer than the years. So you'll have plenty of daylight to bag some summits. Venus is a harsh and foreboding world. Truly Dante's Inferno come to life. And while you'll see it has some spectacular destinations, if you were to look just on paper, well, it doesn't come across as the best high-pointing destination. Particularly if you think of the amount of peril that you need to put yourself in to achieve any summits. By the numbers, Venus is surprisingly flat. Two-thirds of it is considered plains or smooth terrain. And 50% of the planet well, it only has an elevation of 1,700 feet or less. Even without the absolutely terrible weather and inhospitable surface conditions, you may think of giving this planet a pass. But rest assured, the numbers, they don't tell you the whole story. That remaining third is quite intriguing and is made up of three terrae or continents, elevated areas of highlands. In the northern hemisphere, you'll find Ishtar Terra. It's about the size of Australia. In the southern hemisphere is Aphrodite Terra, similar in size to South America. And at the South Pole, you'll find Lada Terra. It is to these that our journey takes us, serving as convenient guideposts as we endeavor to summit the highest points on each, in addition to taking in some of the other spectacular places of interest on the planet. As we head across the Venusian surface, now you'll get an up-close look at geographical features 
that look like nothing that we have here on Earth. A lot of these are thought to have some direct connection to Venus's volcanic activity. While Venus may look like hell for us, for one group of people, this place is as close to heaven as you can get. The second planet is a volcanologist's dream world. There is no planet in our solar system that has more. Its geography is littered with evidence of its volcanic past, and some of its most unique features are directly related or created by volcanism. There's a bit of mythological irony here, because while Venus is named after the goddess of beauty, it could have easily been named after her ugly husband, Vulcan, the god of fire whose name we get Volcano from. On the way to La Terra, you're going to spot one of these unique geological features, a corona. They were discovered by the Soviets in 1983, and Venus is the only planet that has them, though we later found them on one of the Uranian moons as well. A corona is an elevated plateau with a trench around it, and the name itself means crown. Combining the two, you have a rather fitting name for something that looks like a castle with a moat. How coronae form is still a mystery. The best theory going right now is when hot material in the mantle pushes upwards, it forms the crust into a dome shape. Due to the way rock and lava flows on Venus, the structure then collapses in the center as the magma cools and leaks out the sides. The end result is the crown-like structure. Coronae are one of the clearer indications that Venus is still geologically active. The Lata Terra is the smallest of the three Terra. For high pointers, you're gonna be most interested in its highland section. It's gonna be hard to miss. As you're going along, you'll see a large, dome-type structure rising up almost two miles in height. This is known as the Lada Rise, and it is the only substantial highlands in the South Pole. The Lada Rise is dominated by the Quetzalcoatl Corona, the third largest on the planet, with a diameter of 500 miles. Our first climb to a high point on this world won't exactly be easy. In addition to all the other challenges Venus has to offer, this area in particular is thought to be one of the more volcanically active spots. So proceed with caution. Near the summit of the Lada Rise, there are two smaller features that may be home to the high point for this terra. According to altimetric data, they are of similar height. The first is the Boala Corona. The other, lying directly east, is Urzuli Mons, the only named mountain in the region. Once you make your way to the top, you'll be at an elevation of over 9,000 feet, and it'll provide you with a decent view of the Quetzalcoatl Corona in the South Pole region of Venus. When you're finished, you make your way back down, and we'll turn our attention northward. While we may be finished with Lada Terra, we aren't quite finished with the Corona. As we head north, our next stop will be the largest one on the planet, the colossal Artemis Corona. While Quetzalcoatl was large, Artemis dwarfs it in comparison. It is over four times larger than its South Pole counterpart, and it is one of the most striking features on the planet. The Artemis Corona is an absolutely gargantuan structure. It is 1600 miles in diameter. It's so large that you could take the entire western United States and fit it in there and still have room to spare. Once you get to the top of this plateau, you'll be standing on one of the largest circular structures in our entire solar system. If you can get to the edge, 
you'll get a great view of the magnificent Artemis Chasma as it circles its way around the corona, the largest curved chasma on the planet. You'll also have a phenomenal view of our next two destinations, the northern part of Aphrodite Terra and the Chasmata to the northeast. We'll get to the Chasmata soon enough, but in the meantime, we need to pay a visit to the Aphrodite Terra. This Terra is the largest and most geologically diverse of any on Venus. What it lacks in height, it makes up in size and a whole myriad of features. If there was only one place you could go to to study geology on this planet, well, this is the place. In the heart of the Aphrodite Terra is the Avda Regio. The highlands here rise above three miles and make up the largest plateau on the planet. This is an area of geological secrets and how this plateau formed is a hot topic for the scientific community, with recent findings calling into question whether Venus was a water world at all. We'll trek our way through the rugged terrain towards the Avda Fluctus, a massive lava flow. Beyond it will be our destination. At the top of this peak, you'll be at an elevation of almost 20,000 feet above the global average. These highlands appear organized in a similar fashion to the ridges of the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern U.S. And they're home to a pretty unique phenomena on Venus, the Fountain of Aphrodite. Water, as we know, is a very rare commodity on the planet, but it does actually exist in places. And this place right here seems to have more than others. These highlands seem to channel it and force it up into the atmosphere above, hence the fountain effect. What makes this happen is still being determined. Yet another mystery on a planet full of them. Aphrodite Terra, with all its geographic diversity, could easily be a sightseeing adventure all in itself. But for us, we're going to move out, heading east across the Thetis Regio to one of the most fantastic places on the planet, the Chasmata. It's not just the volcanism, but the sheer volume and dynamic nature of them that makes Venus incredibly interesting. There's a good chance that this planet has an active core and molten mantle, just like Earth and scientific findings have determined that Venus's surface is rather young, at least geologically speaking, and that sometime in, say, the last, say, 300 million years, it underwent a global resurfacing event. Due to the incredible heat and lack of water, the surface of Venus is too soft to form plates like on Earth. Venus has so little water that it can't get rid of its internal heat. So it is suspected the planet undergoes a different type of tectonic and resurfacing activity. Perhaps the best place to find evidence of this is here in the Chasmata, one of the signature bits of topography on Venus. This section of Venus is similar to the rift valleys we find here on Earth. The Chasmata is an absolutely massive series of interconnected canyons. Venus itself has over 33,000 miles of chasms on its surface. The Chasmata is truly one of the wonders of topography on the planet. And our next location, well, it's deep in the heart of it. Located to the northeast of Ceres Corona, you will find the Diana Chasma. It is an impressive canyon, measuring over 1,000 miles in length. If you stood on the rim and peered down, you'd have a drop of almost three miles. A bit of warning before you descend, though. You are about to put your equipment to the ultimate test. On an already hostile world, you're going to go to the most hostile part of it. As you head down, the temperature will increase 
topping out at a blistering 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And air pressure will continue to increase until it is an absolutely crushing 105 times that of Earth's. At the very bottom of this raging Venus furnace, you will be at the lowest point on the planet with an approximate elevation of 9,500 feet below the planetary mean. Since we are on a world of volcanoes, it seems fitting that we should attempt to climb the tallest one. As you climb your way out of Diana Chasma and continue east through the Chasmata, you will eventually come across the small island of Highlands, an area known as the Atla Regio. Sitting just a hair's breadth north of the equator, Mat Mons is the second highest peak on Venus. It is similar in nature to the volcanoes of Hawaii, a shield volcano that grew from a hot spot. Most of the major Venusian volcanoes are thought to be extinct, but there are some suspicions that Montmans may still be alive. This peak is named after Mat, the Egyptian god of justice, and climbing it is going to serve as a great training run for your upcoming attempt on the rooftop of Venus. Mat Mons has an elevation of approximately 26,000 feet, so it's significant. As you ascend upwards, you'll get to experience one of the benefits of climbing on Venus. Just like Earth, as you head upwards, the temperature will start to drop. Same on Venus, well, relatively speaking. Perhaps even better, though, is that the air will start to thin out and the pressure will decrease. Once on top of Mat Mons, you'll be able to take in its two volcanic counterparts, Aza and Sapis Mons, several Corona to the east, and the Chasmata to the west. It is possibly one of the most diverse views on the surface of the planet. Now we make our journey northward to Ishtar Terra and our final destination. As we head north, though, this will probably be your best chance to take in some of the plains of Venus. If Venus ever had oceans, then these would have been the sea floors. Now, though, they're more similar to the mare we find on our moon. Floodplains of lava. In particular, if you have the time to spare, the plains of Atalanta may be the place you want to go. An extreme lowland basin noted for its smoothness. It is also close to another wonder of the planet, the Baltus Valles, one of the longest known channels in our solar system, over 4,300 miles in length. With a width, on average, of one mile, this winding canal was carved out not by water, but lava. As you travel across the plains, Ishtar Terra will rise up from the horizon, the plains giving way to rough highlands and the mountains of your final destination, finally within reach. While smaller and not as geographically diverse as Aphrodite Terra, Ishtar Terra is older and the surface harder. It's thought to have formed prior to Venus's runaway greenhouse effect. If you ever wanted to experience the mountain life on this planet, then this is the place to go. As mentioned earlier, all our destinations have been named for women. There are very few exceptions, and one of them is here, the Maxwell Montes. The range is named after James Clerk Maxwell perhaps the greatest physicist of the 19th century. Maxwell's findings and theories eventually led to the development of radar, the tool that has done so much to help us understand our sister planet. 
One of the fascinating things about this entire area here is its sheer reflectivity. It easily bounces back radar waves, making it one of the brightest objects on the planet. In fact, it bounces them back so easily that this was one of the first things ever discovered on the Venus surface. These mountains are the largest range on the planet, a series of peaks measuring a distance of 540 miles in length. Like most of Ishtar Terra, they are older, possibly formed before the runaway greenhouse effect. In a bit of a twist, these mountains aren't volcanoes. They are theorized to be similar to fault and folding types, like the Rockies in the western United States. Now that we're here, the challenge becomes getting to the rooftop of Venus. And before we go any further, you're going to have to make a choice. There are two primary approaches. If you do opt to come from the west, you will get to experience the Lakshmi Planum in all its glory. It is approximately three miles above the average mean of Venus. Standing in the heart of it will allow you to take in four of the major mountain ranges of the planet. The Acna Montes to the west, the Freya Montes to the north, to the south, the Danu Montes, and our final destination, the Maxwell Montes to the east. It would be a sight to behold, similar to the Tibetan Plateau in the Himalayas. The challenge though for this route is twofold. First, you need to clamber up the steep sides of the plateau, then climb up the even steeper western side of the Maxwell Montes. If you come in from the east, you'll get the benefit of a more gradual approach and get to experience a different type of terrain. It still won't necessarily be easy. After all, this is Venus. Nothing ever is. You'll have to contend with the tesserae first, raised areas that are composed of many ridges and valleys running in different directions. The tesserae are another one of these unique geological formations that you find on Venus. They were also discovered by the Soviets in the 1980s. They're a series of interlocking ridges and grooves. Scientists suspect that they are some of the oldest terrain on the planet, but there is a lot about them that is just not understood. The Fortuna Tesserae is complicated, even for an already complicated style of terrain. It appears as though several different versions of tesserae terrain were smashed together. And you'll have to pick your way through this jumble until you are at the base of the range. As you start to ascend, you'll spot one of the most distinct landmarks on the Maxwell Montes, the Cleopatra Crater. This was originally thought to be a caldera, but further investigation revealed it to be an impact crater that smashed into the side of the mountain range. Once you get to the top of the ridge, you're going to want to pick out Scotty Mons, the actual high point of the Maxwell Montes. Scotty is the Norse goddess of mountains and skiing, which is good because just when you think you have Venus figured out, it's going to go and throw one more curveball at you. It's time to put on your skis or snowshoes because you're about to experience one of the weirdest of Venus's many phenomena. Venus appears to have snow, but it isn't like any snow you'd find on Earth. This is snow that is formed from the condensation of heavy metals, such as lead sulfide and bismuth. As you have trudged upwards, the temperature and pressure have been decreasing, allowing for snowfall to cover these high elevation peaks. It's thought that this snow cover is partly responsible for the high level of reflectivity of these mountains. The snow isn't going to be the only thing you need to worry about up here. 
as you've been heading upwards, you are getting closer to that sulfuric cloud layer. So the corrosive effects of it are starting to increase as well. So you're going to want to make sure you keep an eye on the condition of your exosuit. By the time you reach the summit of Scotty Mons, not only will you be on the rooftop of Venus, you'll also be standing at the coldest and least pressurized point on the planet's entire surface. The pressure will have dropped by half, and the temperature will have dropped almost 200 degrees. You will find yourself at an elevation of approximately 35,000 feet above the global average, and have a stunning view of the Maxwell Montes range running north and south, the Lakshmi Planum to the west, the Fortuna Tesserae to the east. Reaching the rooftop of Venus will be the culmination and capstone of all the epic adventures you had on the Venusian surface. But it won't be held against you if you want to hightail it off this incredibly hostile world. So. For now, we bid Venus adieu. While Venus may have been fraught with peril for us, it may not always be this hostile to life. There is one theory that believes when Venus's volcanism slows down, then the planet itself will depressurize and cool. If there's enough water vapor to condense, it could possibly lead to bodies of water on the surface, which in turn will help reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere more. Slowly, the planet would become more Earth-like. Of course, this scenario is likely millions of years from now, but it's a nice thought as you rocket away from the planet. Speeding away from Venus, we're going to be ready for some rest and relaxation. Fortunately, our next destination will be a whole lot more familiar. Our own home planet, the pale blue dot itself, Earth. I'm Skymar Thaler. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Rooftops of the Solar System. Before you go, click that subscribe button below, and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.